because it's uh, we all had lunch. I assume you all had lunch. Welcome to the 45th uh, Colorado Convention, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Today is March the 26th, 2018. Correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that's 26. And the name of this session is A Visit with the Legends. Uh, I thank all of you for coming. My name is Mike Seastrom, and I'm going to serve as moderator for this session. And uh, today our panelists are three very, very distinguished uh, individuals in our dance activity. We had a fourth one scheduled. Uh, Bob Brundage, uh, due to uh, health reasons, was unable to attend our convention. So I apologize, but uh, on the other hand, I think it's fortunate because each one of these, um, of our panelists today, could take the entire session to tell their story. There's, a, there's, there's some really terrific individuals here that have been involved in our activity for many, many years. And um, we're, we're fortunate, I think, I personally believe we're fortunate to have a session like this so that we can, uh, we, we can hear these stories. We've been fortunate in the past to have others uh, that I even see in the audience here as uh, our panelists for this, uh, this session. So I'm excited. Uh, I was excited when uh, I heard who our panelists were. Uh, it's always been a little bit of an issue in, in, in how much time we really have to get their stories. So um, I'd like to start out uh, this afternoon with a, a gentleman that, that uh, I have never had the privilege of meeting, and yet I, I, I've heard so much about him over the years, and uh, as a member of the Lloyd Shaw Foundation, have uh, kind of had somewhat of a connection with this gentleman. But uh, Dr. Bill Lichman is from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and, and uh, he's Fortunate, we're fortunate to be in his backyard, and uh, I also understand that uh, earlier for the beginner dance leader party seminar that you were also, Bob, uh, privileged to have Bill and his band come in and do a session about uh, working with live music, and so, uh, Bill, could you could you tell us a little bit how how you started dancing, how you started calling? What? Yeah, one two. Oh. I, I hope you can hear me because I can hear me. So, um, yeah, we live in Albuquerque. My wife Chris is in the third row back there with Ellen, and she's a great help to me and has been for 54, 55 years almost. You'll find out when you get home. I pay, I pay a penalty whenever I mention that because I never get it quite right. Well, how did I start? Well, that's an interesting question. I, I graduated from high school in Florence, Colorado. I don't know if anybody knows where Florence is, but it's, it's one of the major metropolises of southeast Colorado. Uh, and the downtown area is like two blocks long. We have, we have one stoplight. And at that time, it was working from about 10 in the morning until about 3 in the afternoon, and then they would turn it off. Uh, <laughs> You, that was the entertaining time to go downtown when they turned it off because nobody knew quite what to do. But I graduated from high school in 1956. And later that summer, in August, I was wandering around downtown, as I often do. It doesn't take much, very long to do that. Um, but in the evening, I came across a group of people on a side street between the Florence Hardware and the Florence Hotel, kind of milling around in the street. And there was music playing. And they milled around sort of in time to the music. I couldn't figure out what in the world they were doing, so I went around the corner to see where the music was coming from. There was a truck, a flatbed truck, parked in the alley behind the hotel. And there were, it was a band on the flatbed truck, a fiddler, guitar player, and I think they had a piano up on the, on the truck. Um, so they were playing music, and there was a guy on the, on the truck also who was yelling at the people who were milling around. And, uh, well, I didn't know what they were doing, so I went out to join the crowd. Now, the crowd was about maybe 12 to 15 people. And um, there were a few kids, young kids, and a few older people, and one teenager. That was me. <coughs> so I joined in, and I found out later that that was a square dance. 
that's what introduced me to square dancing. My parents didn't dance. I never, I, I never saw them dance. But that's how I got started. About two weeks later, I went to the University of Colorado in Boulder. And I was so impressed by that milling around process with the music that I looked up the student square dance club on campus, which was named Calico and Boots. Calico and Boots was uh, formed in 1945 by students from the Cheyenne Mountain School in Colorado Springs. And so the dancing they were doing was very much like the dancing that Lloyd Shaw and Dorothy were promoting. And it was a, a lot of fun, great time, and there were girls. <laughs> now, I've not listed the attractions of that group in the order in which I should have. <laughs> but anyway, we had a marvelous time. And within a few weeks, um, since the students were the ones who ran the club, they did all the teaching, they did all the calling, and in fact, the, the faculty sponsors of the club never attended. But that was an advantage. We could do anything we wanted. And so I asked one of the callers if I could learn to call. And that was Gib Gilbert. Of all the people that I've met in square dancing and dancing in general, Gib Gilbert was the most influential in my dancing life. And so I owe a great deal to Herbert Gilbert. Anybody here know him? Great. He was a wonderful guy um, and a great caller. So I learned a lot from him. About three months into this uh, involvement with Calico and Boots, I saw that they had a demonstration dance team, too. So I asked if I could join that. And they were so desperate, they said yes. <laughs> so I got a chance to dance with the exhibition team. I stayed with the club for all four years at the University of Colorado. During the last year, I happened to get elected as president. I guess I stood too long in one place, uh, as it usually happens. Perhaps you've had that experience as well. So that's how I got started in square dancing. Bill, you went on then with the, the demonstration groups and, and uh, um, did that continue through your, your uh, college experience? Well, my college experience, yes, because that was all at the University of Colorado. After graduation, I taught high school chemistry, physics, and mathematics, which naturally goes along with dancing, um, in, in Florence, actually. And after one year, that was enough. So I went to graduate school at the University of Utah. They didn't have a square dance club, but my wife ran, well, she wasn't my wife at the time. She eventually became a good friend, and then my wife. She ran a folk dance club on campus, and I went to the folk dance club and danced with, it, with that for a little bit, and then in the new school year, they always had an opening dance to do something, and I suggested to the club that perhaps we could have a square dance, and I would call it. Now, you understand the amount of experience in calling I had by that time was all of, I think, three months. That's it. But I knew more than anybody else did at the University of Utah, so I got away with it. And uh, th that's really an advantage. If you know more than your dancers, you're ahead of the game. So we had a great time, and we started a, a square dance club there called Ribbons and Spurs. Had no idea if it's still going on. But we had a demonstration team as well. Then I graduated finally, um, got a degree, and after a couple of years of postdoc, went to the University of New Mexico, which is here in Albuquerque. 1967 and I was wandering around on campus one evening and I heard music <laughs> and so I gravitated toward where that was coming from and they were doing folk dances in one of the gymnasiums on campus and I wandered in there and 
suggested that maybe we could do a square dance. So, yeah, they decided they wanted to do a square dance. We had a pretty good time. And so we decided to start a square dance club. And we had six people that signed up to be in the square dance club. And that's how we started Wagons and Wagon Wheel Square Dance Club with its demonstration team at the University of New Mexico. So we've had experience now with three student clubs. Those days are pretty much over. We don't really do that and very, very much. But Wagon Wheels lasted for about 15 years. So that was a great experience. And you were involved with them that whole 15 years? Yes, I was the caller, the teacher, and the choreo choreographer for the dance team as well as for the social club that we had meeting. We had probably 10 to 12 squares at, a, at one time in that club. So it was a sizable group. And in the later years, we had more and more trouble with the administration in trying to get a place on campus to dance. And so it, it finally was so bad that we just couldn't keep track of the times and places and we lost the, the dancers. So it eventually came to an end. Now Bill, then there's a transition. How did that transition to the Lloyd Shaw Foundation? Uh, your, your connection with uh, Don Armstrong? Well, that's the next chapter. About 1969 or 70, um, I was beginning to decide I really didn't want to stay in square dance calling anymore. Uh, it was uh, not as entertaining as it had been. I've been calling now for, at that point, about 10, 12 years. And I guess it's kind of like when you reach adolescence or something, your life changes. Well, that was my condition at that point. And I happened to mention that to Gib Gilbert. And so he suggested that I write a letter to Dorothy Shaw because she held a summer dance camp every year in August at her home in Colorado Springs. It's called the Fellowship of the Lloyd Shaw Foundation. Now, Dorothy Shaw had shown up at the uh, University of Colorado in 1957 in the fall, and she came to Calico, Calico and Boots and watched our demonstration team. So I had met her uh, that, at that time. The reason she came was because that Lloyd Shaw had passed away earlier that year, May, I think, in 1957, or no, 1958. Then, uh, so she was there in the fall of 58. And she was looking at the Calico and Boots dancers because of their history as a possible group to take the place of the Cheyenne Mountain dancers for the pageant that was to be held at the National Convention in Denver in 1959. For some reason, she felt that we could do it. So we got the chance to dance in Denver during that pageant. It was a great experience. And we really enjoyed Dorothy's show. So I wrote her a letter and asked her if it would be possible for us to come to the fellowship in 1969. And she said yes, and so we went. That was the beginning of a wonderful association for the next about 10 years, uh, when she finally got to the point where she couldn't handle the, the fellowship anymore. But for those of you who don't know, the fellowship was a group of callers, teachers, leaders in dance and social recreation uh, who met once a year for a week to share and to teach each other the art of teaching dance. There were people there from with experience in all sorts of fields, round dancing, contra dancing, square dancing, social dancing of various kinds, international folk, you name it, almost anything was, was there represented by someone. Don Armstrong was one of several of that caliber of individual from across the country. Bob, Bob Osgood came, oh my. Bob Osgood came, and uh, uh, Don Armstrong, Herbie Todd, Sherm Walker from Oklahoma, uh, Dina Fresh, uh, Carlotta Hegeman. Uh, we had choreographers, we had teachers, we had leaders of all kinds. And uh, I, I kind of 
hesitate to list names because uh, I would leave out somebody. Uh, Cal Campbell was there with Judy. And he, he participated and contributed to the whole program. Ken Kernan and Sharon were a part of the activity as well. I could go on for a long time with the groups that were there and the people that shared. Don Armstrong, as well as Dorothy Shaw, were two of the three people that I classify as my mentors, as the people who most greatly influenced my involvement in dancing uh, with groups of people. And I also class them really as my salvation of not quitting when I was on the edge, just about ready to do so. And essentially, almost all of my dance history has come since 1969. Uh, and I, I really owe that to Don Armstrong. He was a fantastic leader. I, I hope that there are people here who have known Don. Right there? Yes. He, Don and Marie were wonderful people. He introduced me, to, for example, to Peaceful Valley, uh, Peaceful Valley Lodge. We called there for about 10 years during the summers. Uh, that's a great experience, uh, to call a whole evening of dancing without doing an Alaman left. Try it sometime. It's a, it's a challenge. It can be a challenge to you. Or to call an evening of dancing just using um, 10 and 12 year olds and keeping them entertained for all of that time and out of their parents' hair, which is a challenge too. Well, Don helped us, Kristen and I, to get involved with the kinds of programs in American dance that were going on in Europe. So we had a chance to visit Germany, Belgium, Holland, Denmark, Switzerland, England, and traveled back and forth between the United States and America, or the United States and Europe for, I would expect, 15 years. Sometimes going four times in one year to Europe, back and forth. A marvelous experience because we stayed with the dancers in their homes, not in hotels, but in their homes. And when we were there, we would ask them, what is it that you like to see and to do? And they would take us to their favorite places. And that is a wonderful thing to do because you don't get the tourist stuff, you get their personal favorites. And you get to know them very well. We went back and forth to Denmark, for example, probably 15 times, maybe. 10? More than 10, probably. I, I taught more than 100 people to call traditional American square dancing in Denmark. Great experience because they speak Danish. <laughs> Except when they're calling squares. And then they speak the English version, the, the, the commands for the square in English, but the pattern, think about it. Every traditional caller will call with pattern to fill in the spaces in between the commands, to join the band as an instrument with your rhythmic voice and the words you choose. That helps the whole experience of square dancing for the people who are there. Now, what, what does a Dane do to fill in with patter? And they ask me, do we have to learn all of this garbage <laughs> that you put out rapid fire during the square? And we have to do that in English? Now they could ask that because they had an interpreter who could make me understand. And I told them, no, you don't have to do that. It, I can't imagine 
changing language in the middle of a square dance. Give the command and then do the pattern in some other language. But they did. I told them, why don't you recite nursery rhymes rhythmically? Give the command and then recite a verse of a nursery rhyme. So they did that. The whole floor erupted in laughter. <laughs> the only thing they could understand in the whole business was the nursery rhyme. <laughs> and they thought that was just classic. So we, we really had a wonderful time with the people in Denmark. We met Margot Gunzenhauser, who led most of the square dancing in Denmark. She's a great young lady. Not so young nowadays. But anyway, she, she's a marvelous person, a wonderful leader. So, Bill, is that Bill, long enough? No, I was going to say, you're the current chairman of, uh, or the current president of the Lloyd Shaw Foundation. As we wrap this up, maybe yes. you can go on and tell us a little bit about your involvement with Lloyd Shaw. Oh, yeah, that's, Lloyd Shaw Foundation. that's the title they've given me, but the job is really <laughs> unique. Um, I became, I've been pres president of the foundation twice. Once toward the end of the 90s, 1998 through 2001 or 2, and again recently. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful organization. It's based on the teaching principles and uh, philosophy of Lloyd Shaw, and trying to promote and preserve the things that he did, which were very successful in his school. For those of you who don't know, he became principal of Shine Mountain School in 1918 and started his dance team with folk dances in 1921. He went to the Colorado Seed Show, which is the state fair in Pueblo, in 1934 and saw American square dancing for the first time. They had contests to see whose team would be the best. He was so enthralled with the fact that there were folk dances, American folk dances, which were truly American, that he invited a caller that he found in Colorado Springs to come to the school to teach the teachers how to square dance and how to call. That brought square dancing into his demonstration teams. 1941, he started summer camps. They ran through 1950, approximately. And then, uh, and they ended up to be three times in the summer, beginning intermediate and advanced. It was the advanced group that made the fellowship and eventually made the foundation. And that's what the Lloyd Shaw Foundation is. Now, Bill and Kristen, you guys have been involved with the archives um, in, in countless hours with, with the archives. and. Uh, have been a huge part of the, the Lloyd Shaw Dance Center um, here. You want to just give me a little bit of a... Okay, there is a dance center in Albuquerque. I'm not sure where to hold this. Okay, uh, and it's located not too far from here. I think there's a group that's going to visit tomorrow afternoon. And if you're interested, we'd love to have you come by. Bob Osgood's collection of portraits, the Square Dance Hall of Fame, is hung in the, in the main, main dance hall of the building. And I, I think you would enjoy seeing all of the people who are portrayed there. The archives was also housed there, but has recently be, been transferred to the Denver University Special Collections Library. It started in 1972 with a single film of the Silver Spurs dance team from Washington State under the direction of Red Henderson. With that one film, that began the archives. At the end, we had probably 200,000 items in the archives, a, a full 73-foot semi-truck load of material went from Albuquerque to Denver uh, to form the special collection of square dancing that is there in, in Denver. Bob Brundage, who was supposed to be here this, this afternoon, uh, was a, a main part in recent years of the archives. And uh, I'm sorry that he isn't here today. How about a nice hand for Bill Litchman and Christian. Thank you guys for being here and telling your story. Again, you could have a, a 
another, I'm sure another hour or more, just to talk about uh, where you guys have been, and and, uh, and we really appreciate the incredible impact that you've had uh, on our dance activity. We're going to shift gears on over to uh, Stu Shacklett, and we're pleased to have Stu here uh, this year because uh, um, he's got quite a story to tell too. And uh, Stu started out in high school also with uh, with square dancing. So Stu, do you want to give us a little bit of, of where you started? Okay, uh, in our home city uh, community, uh, my father was very uh, important in helping to develop a community center. It was called the Platorium. And the Platorium, once a month, would have a square dance. And I was in my teens, I was in high school, and we would, at that time, the callers, of course, all of which were old, and they would get up and say, we're going to dance uh, Birdie in the Cage. And the other seven people that were in the square with me, our little clique, we had a clique, and they would come up and say, Stu, how does this go? How do we do this? And I would explain it to them, and we'd get up and we would dance Birdie in the Cage. And, of course, normally the callers would walk the dancers through part of it to get you started on it, and then you go ahead and call it. But I was the one that knew what the birdie in the cage was, and how it worked, and, and told them how it worked. I became involved in joining the service. I joined the Navy, and while I was in the Navy, they put me aboard a submarine tender, which was in the uh, San Diego Bay, and it was anchored there, and all the submarines would come in and tie up to the tender and get supplies and so on. So I volunteered to go aboard a submarine. So I was stationed aboard a submarine. And every ship that the United States has, has practice drills on duty stations if there's a, a battle or something going on. It's called battle stations. And my battle station was down among uh, the high pressure air compressors. And there were two compressors in this little bitty room. And I was the only one that was there. And the pressure that they would build up with those air compressors was 2,000 pounds. And in the building of the pressure, you could hear them hammering like a hammer on the metal uh, as the air was pushed through the valves and so on. And the valves closing as they air would come back, but the high pressure air was used for the recoil on the big 16 inch guns that were aboard ship. So I was in the room where the air compressors were banging all the time when we were on a special sea detail. And any time we went to sea or any time we were coming back in, we would always be on special sea details. And I got to the point where I could sing sword inches all day long and nobody knew it. Because <laughs> as the, the compressors were going on making all the noise and here I was just singing along. And it got to the point where, and at that time, there were no books that were written about all of these square dance movements and, and the way they worked. But I had, some uh, opportunity to join color associations. San Diego Colors Association, uh, which I became president of one year uh, during that period of time. I joined the Northern California Colors Association. I joined the Southern California Colors Association. 
and each of these associations would send out news letters once a month on everything that was presented at the meetings. So any new material or material that was being taught at the caller association meetings would be sent out as a write-up from that particular meeting. Stu, when you when you and I talked before, you all this was the early 1950s. You also had a subscription to Sets and Order. Yes. Uh, in fact, I have a complete set of Sets and Orders from the first magazine that came out to the last one that was there when he closed it down, and they're all uh, on the shelf in my center with little books that they were put in. We had. Uh, little covers that you could buy and put a set of a yearly uh, magazines in that set and that cover and then it would have the date on that cover. But anyhow, I have the in my uh, Folk Dance Records Center and uh, while I was in the service I learned all of the visiting couple figures that would be written and at that period of time, which was uh, probably in the late 40s, they started developing new calls that involved not the visiting couple type of figure, but opposite couples working together to involve the outside couples, and then you would have all four couples working in figures. And that material was very interesting to me you know that you could involve more than two couples when you were dancing and be dancing all four couples at the same time, not just one couple leading to the next and doing something. Stu, who were, who were your mentors back then? Okay, uh, at that time, while I was in the service, uh, the YMCA in San Diego had square dancing every Monday night. And there were two callers that shared those Monday nights. One was Harold Lindsay, and the other was Bob Shepard. And I became friends with both of them, and they knew that I knew something about square dancing. And they would you put me on as a guest tip uh, at least once during the evening. So I got to call uh, a guest tip each e Monday evening at the the regular square dance. Now the square dancers were all servicemen, all coming from all different ships from all over the bay. And the ladies would be what they call the girls service organization. GOS girls. GSO girls, yeah. GSO. Girls service organization. And they would come to the YMCA and dance with the military that was there at the time and uh, then of course they would leave and it became very popular with the, the younger folks that they wanted to have uh, another session of square dancing during the week and we seemed to pick a Thursday night which was open at the YMCA and the YMCA said well we'll give you a room to dance in if uh, you you know if you want to do that, so we formed a club of about eight couples: the girls service organization and the military that would come and dance on Monday nights with us. And we formed a club called the Wise Alamanders. Now, Stu, after the military, you came back to Kentucky around 1958? Uh, yeah. And, well, yeah, it was a little bit earlier than that, in the earlier 50s. I got out of the service in 52, and uh, so about 53, I guess, or 54, I came from California back to Kentucky and I formed the Kentucky Colors Association because they didn't have any association and there were only about a half a dozen guys who were doing any calling at all. Uh, one of them was uh, Ray Bond. I don't know how many of you heard of Ray Bond, but uh, Ray Bond was there 
And uh, uh, but we formed an association, and I was, of course, elected president. Because you knew the any squares, you knew all the answers, and uh, we uh, continued to dance. And but when I was in San Diego before I left San Diego, I developed where I had a dance every night. I had five clubs that I called for on a regular basis, and one of them was up in the mountainous areas of the Laguna Mountains, northeast of San Diego. And there was a group that was an Indian reservation. And this Indian reservation had a group of Indians called the Poway Indians. And they wanted square dancing. So I drove to Poway, which was about 35, 40 miles from San Diego. And that was on a uh, Wednesday night that we went to Poway and we would go up and I would dance I would call for the Poway Indians and when we had our festivals and everybody would come from all around and dance the Poway Indians would bring their teepee and set it up and then they would all sit around the teepee cross-legged and uh, wait for the next hit to start and then get up and dance. But you see the, all the Indians sitting around the tent. And, but it was a good group. And it was the Poway Indians. But I came back to Kentucky though. And when I left California, I had those five clubs that I was leaving. And uh, I had uh, started the uh, Callers Association there in Louisville and I started calling and within a year I had uh, another five clubs I was working with. Every night I was going out and calling square dances. But I was also teaching school during the day and would go out and call square dances at night. And, uh, it became very, very rigorous for me to be able to keep up with the schedule that I had established for myself. And uh, Stu, how did you get involved with the Kentucky Dance Institute? Okay, I was just getting to that. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> there was a lady in Louisville who taught international folk dancing. And she was a good friend of mine. And she liked me. And I liked her. So we were good friends. She was much older than I was. I was still a teenager. Here she was 60 or 70 years old. and uh, But we got along well. And a group in New Jersey, uh, Frank Kaltman of the Folkgraph Records, uh, Ricky Holden, uh, Stan Burley, and then they hired two people from Kentucky to come and be part of the staff. One was M.G. Karsner who taught physical education at the University of Kentucky, and the other was Shirley Durham from Louisville. And with this staff then, they started a group that they called uh, Folk Dance Camp. And the Folk Dance Camp uh, danced for a couple of years in New Jersey. And then the Kentucky people uh, talked them into moving the dance camp to Kentucky. So they moved down to uh, a university there at Moorhead State University and started dancing at the Kentucky Dance Institute at Moorhead University. And we danced there at Moorhead University for 
20 years. And every night that we would start, the president of the university would come and welcome us to the university. In fact, I have a plaque on the wall at home. It's a thank you from the president of the university for the years that we spent at their university. But they had a spell with computers. <coughs> and when computers became important, they took the ballroom that we danced in with the wooden floor that floated and installed computers all over the floor, which gave us no room to dance longer, and they wanted us to go dance in, in the drill hall, which was uh, for the military to drill in, and the drill hall was a concrete floor, and it had poles that were 10 feet, there would be another pole of concrete blocks or something. And we said, no, we didn't want to do that, so we moved from Moorhead to find another location that we could dance in. But we danced there for 28 years, and during that period of time, I became involved in learning more about folk dancing. Now, I noticed that uh, he talked about folk dancing earlier, but I learned that folk dancing was as much fun as square dancing. And I became very involved in the folk area, and uh, Shirley Durham was one of the directors of the uh, Kentucky Dance Institute, and uh, I was fortunate enough to be available when they needed another person to act as director. And she asked me if I would be a co-director with her of the Institute, and that was probably in the mid-50s. And so I said, sure, I'd love to be a director. And so I learned all about international folk dancing, but this is one of the syllabus that we put out in our dance camp that includes folk dancing. And our folk dance uh, program involved getting folk dance leaders from other nations to come in and teach their dance like the Bulgarian, the Yugoslavian, the Lithuanian, and the Israeli dances. But we had these teachers coming and teaching on the staff, and I would do the square dancing. So we had the American dance squares, and we had all of the international folk dance leaders coming in at the same time. And one of the leaders that would come, most all of the people that came were leaders of other groups that would come to learn new material that they could take home to their group to teach new dances to their groups. One young man and his daughter was... <laughs> there's, there's, there's this connection here. <laughs> Was named Gada. So, they were named Celie. I'm now named Gada. <laughs> right. And anyhow, her and her father and most of all her mother would come with them. But they were there at the Kentucky Dance Institute. And they we started putting out our syllabus of all the dances that teachers would be dancing would be written directions on how to do that dance. And we found that that wasn't enough. So we decided we would take the Friday after the week would be just about over. It'd be ending on the Saturday's breakfast. But on Friday, we would ask the dance leaders to review what they had done during the week. So if they had to walk through it again, they walked through it. If they had to teach it, they'd teach it again. 
if they, but they would dance everything that they had taught during the week. We started doing, when video came in available, we started doing a video of all of the review sessions. And uh, the dancers at that time would say, well, just, I can't read these instructions. I don't understand what they mean. So with the directions and the pictures of what they were doing, it gave the dancers more opportunity to be able to teach that dance to their dancers. And so we put out a syllabus so that all of them got the written word and we made available to them a video of the dances that they were taught during that week. Uh, Stu, how did that then transition to the Kentucky Dance Foundation? Okay. <coughs> I was just about to get to that. <laughs> I'm glad you're there. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I've been retired for some time, and when Mike called me last week and asked if I would be here with Betsy and, and these other people, uh, <laughs> Bill and whatever, Anyhow, uh, I was so thrilled that he asked me that I, I said, sure, I'd love to be there and do that. So, but many of the people would donate money to the Dance Foundation in order to get more leaders from other nations to come in and, and teach the dances from the other countries, the folk dances. And uh, they said, you know, we can't claim this as a tax reduction because it's not a foundation. So I decided that we needed to have a foundation so that the donations could be considered as a donation to a nonprofit organization that would give them an opportunity to have a tax deduction. So we formed a all the legalization that went on, going through the state, going through all the lawyers and, and so on. We made the, uh, the Kentucky Dance Foundation at that time. And that was probably in the uh, 60s when we did that. And uh, so the monies that anybody donated to uh, the Kentucky Dance Institute could be a foundation uh, donation and it would then be a tax deduction for them. And uh, today we have a building that I call the Kentucky Dance Foundation because Michael Herman, who was the person who produced all of the folk dancer records and they were all 78s. Most of you know the big heavy thick record. Somebody's phone training. <laughs> and uh, Michael Herman passed away and he left his inventory of records to his heirs and his heirs said we want to sell these. Anybody want to buy them? And nobody offered to buy what they had to sell. And they said, well, we're going to take them to the dump and dump them. And they went to the dump. And the people at the dump said, oh, yeah, you can dump them here. 35 cents a pound. And we looked around and said, there's a lot of pounds. <laughs> And they had two <coughs> units that were storage units that they were paying rents on every month. And they said, we've got to get rid of these records because we can't afford to pay these rents. So they said, tell you what we'll do. We'll give these records to anybody who pay to have them all the way. So, Dr. Lewis, who was a folk dance leader in a small town south of Louisville, 
Uh, he lives in town. Dr. Lewis and I decided that we would put up the money to haul the records away. So we hired a company to do the hauling, and they hauled two semi-trailer trucks <laughs> full of nothing but phonograph records all the way from New York to Kentucky. Now I had built a building that was 40 by 80 with a full basement and a dance floor on the first floor that was uh, 40 by 40, over about 10 squares. And uh, then we had a couple of office areas. But when we got the records from Bible Herman's estate, we found that, that they were all mixed up. They were on the shelf and the people took them off the shelf, a handful from each shelf. And, and so they were mixed. And we had to go through a process of separating the records from the different labels. We had over a hundred labels that were included in his inventory. And Michael found that it was uh, important to include square dancing music as much as folk dance music. So uh, we had a lot of square dance tunes in Windsor, McGregor, uh, and like that. We had some love job. And we, I separated this. It took me about two years to do the separation of all of these records in the, in the building that I was in. And I established rolls of shelving. And the shelves were 36 inch metal shelves that had about six shelves in this unit. And I would put three or four of those together and make an aisle. And then I'd have uh, another row behind them, which would be a second aisle and so on. Stu, how many records do you think you have now? They're still there, right? They're, everything's yeah, organized? Yeah, I still have yeah. I, I'd say there's over a million. In, in that basement? Yes. And the dance floor is still being used? Yes. No. Dance floor is still there, but it's <laughs> it's not being used. But it's being used for when I moved from my home to a senior citizen home. Uh, they moved all of my stuff from my home into the center, and much of the dance floor is taken up with odds and ends. Now they came from my home, and. Uh, but the dance floor is still there, and I have uh, a room that has uh, cases of uh, arts and crafts that were done for the music that Michael made. And I had over a hundred boxes. And we know the boxes that the movie people use are like that big square. And there would be about a hundred records in each of those boxes. And the 33 and a third records would fill that box. And I had over a hundred boxes of 33 and a third records that I had to separate into nationalities so that I could put them on the shelf. All of the Russian records would be with the Russian outfit. All of the uh, Portuguese and the B with that outfit, and each of these were separated. So this is a museum now, isn't it? It's it's somewhat of a museum. Sort of. It's everything there is is uh, older and, and are really show pieces. Uh, but Dr. Lewis uh, became very involved in the. Uh, computer, and every record that was on a shelf, he would take off the shelf and record it in the computer with the number 
and where it was located, what shelf it was on. And then he would bring it back and put it back on the shelf. So it's all been digitized. Then. Everything has been digitized and everything is in the computer. If I go to the computer and put uh, uh, all the cabbage down, that's a title for a record. Uh, okay, our recording record. Those digital files will come up? That, they would come up and tell me every shelf that you could find that ball that gave it down, and it might be six different records That's that had fantastic. that same tune, but it would identify each record on what shelf, what or what row it was in, and which of the six shelves in that section it was, and what the number was of that record. And so, so a tremendous amount of work. Everything is, yeah. is yeah. there. Stu, thank you so much for being here at the Skull Lab Convention, for, for uh, all your involvement in square dancing and Call Lab, because you were at the first Call Lab Convention, uh, along with Bill and Betsy, you were at the first. Yeah. No. I mean, Okay, okay. So we want to hear from, from Betsy and, and Stu, thank you so much. How about a nice day? So I'd like to I like to get to Betsy because Betsy's got quite a story and and, uh, and your involvement and connection with Stu goes way back. So tell us where you began. Well, I be I began square dancing because my parents danced and the person who taught them to dance, whose name I have no clue of anymore, uh, did a series of lessons or programs for children at the YMCA in Metuchen, New Jersey. And basically, there were, there were three sessions a night, starting with the youngest kids and finishing with the high school kids. I was probably, I was in first grade, I'm guessing, and probably five going on six when I started to dance. And, you know, they talked about the old time dancing, visiting couple, that's what we did. What we, what we do now wasn't invented yet. And so that's where I started. And my parents, um, got uh, quite involved and they hosted visiting callers. They, Frank Kaltman that Stu mentioned with the Folkcraft Records, his home office was in Newark, New Jersey, which was just a little north of us. So I remember being in that, in that um, building. He had a large Doberman pincher to help keep security. <laughs> and, and of course, I'm about this tall and so is the Doberman pincher. So it was quite intimidating. And the first, the first of the dance camps, or first or second of the dance camps that turned into Kentucky Dance Institute was held in New Jersey, and I went there with my parents at Stoke State Forest. Now, I have a superstition to this day because of that camp. The first evening, I said, I'm, I'm a kid, I'm going to be out in the woods, I'm going to play, I'm going to dance in the night or whatever, and the first evening, they started the program with an Israeli dance called Mayim, which means water. It rained the rest of the week. <laughs> to this day, I do not use singing calls that mention rain unless either it's a drought, like I could use one now because I need water, or if it's already raining. But to this day, I do not use any singing calls about rain unless it's already raining. No because rain dances. <laughs> no rain. No. So, and we also followed the Dan Kentucky Dance Institute to Kentucky for a while and attended. And when I heard Stu was going to be on the panel, he has the 2017 syllabus. I, this is the 1958 syllabus that I brought along. And that, and, that was your first caller school? Yes. That was my first caller school was at KDI. Uh, Ricky Holden was a square dance caller at that point in time and taught. My dad and I attended the school. My mother was not there because she had broken her ankle and wasn't able to dance that year, so she stayed home, and my dad and I went to KDI and attended the Square Dance Caller School. Now, at the end of the week, each one of us who was in the, the school had to call a dance at the evening program. I, I guess it was kind of a graduation thing. So uh, the dance I called was Chase the Rabbit, visiting couple dance. There was no monitor, so Ricky Holden was standing up by me on the table, beating out the beat, because the speaker was kind of ahead of me, uh, and I couldn't really hear the music properly. 
And when I was done, and I was successful, I still went outside, and because of all the tension, because I'm really a shy person, I literally cried for at least 15 minutes and said, I'll never do this again. <laughs> Not ever. But, but then you have to fast forward, because obviously I have done it again. So you have to fast forward to 62 in Miami at the National Square Dance Convention. In the youth hall, there was a girl caller I think, I think her name was Charlotte Watkins, but I can't guarantee that. And a cute boy whose name I have no idea about. And I was dancing with a cute boy, and the girl caller had a great attitude about, I'm a caller, la di da. And I looked, I wanted to impress my partner, and I said, well, I could do that. And my dad had a teen club, and I went home and told him I wanted to be calling again. And that's where it started. Uh, and I never saw the boy again, and I think the girl got married at about age 18, and that was the end of her in square dancing. But here I am. I seem to, I seem to once I get started on things, keep going. So, um, my, we stopped at some point going to KDI. I'm not sure why. I suspect it had to do with money. Because my parents went to the first na their, their first national convention, and mine, in Detroit in 1961. And I suspect we didn't have the money to go to the National Convention and to KDI. So they made a choice. But my background encompassed the folk dancing and the square dancing and the contra dancing. And still to this day, I just see it as a different sort of interest. It's one continuum. One of the fun things that's happened recently at home, I go contra dancing on Wednesday evenings in Princeton, New Jersey. It's my recreation. And I met one of the contra callers there, a guy named Bob Isaacs. And he, he Googled me. He found out I was a square dance caller and Googled me. Now, I had kept it kind of low key. I, this was my chance to be somebody without 47 ribbons. And, but Bob Googled me, and then he, he started asking me questions. And after a while, he came out to our square dance club which is called the Rutgers Promenaders, and started on the Rutgers University campus, but left campus. And he found that we did not meet the stereotypes that he was expecting, so he had a good time and he joined the club. So periodically, there are, in his contra dance uh, choreography, there's modern Western square dancing used in one way or another, just creeping in. So to get back to me growing up in the activity. So here I am with a teen club that my dad had called the Church Mice. And I called there. And now I'm in, I'm in high school and then in college. So I was not calling outside of the, the uh, in other clubs a lot. My first job as a, as a full fledged well, as a caller for a whole evening was for the Rutgers University Club. I was then, I think, a sophomore in high school. And in New Jersey, you couldn't get a driver's license until 17. So my dad was sick in bed. That's why he wasn't going to call the dance. I had the same cold, but I wasn't quite as flat out as he was. So my mother drove me the hour's drive up to the New Brunswick, where the university campus was, and I called the dance. Now, I got stuck when I started calling. I started with singing calls, and transitioning into patter escaped me for quite a while. So here I am. I called every singing call I knew, and the dance wasn't over. So I called them again. <laughs> and the kids didn't care. In the meantime, since I said I had the same cold my, my dad had, my mother would go out. We were on, the, on the campus in a, a building called Gibbons Cabin, and it had a kitchen. So we'd go, she'd go down the stairs from the dance hall out to the kitchen and made me hot tea with lemon drops that I could take in between every, every tip. And every time, she, she told me later, I don't understand why they didn't move. Every time she went down the steps, there was a couple necking on the steps and she disturbed them. <laughs> so that was my first full job of it as a caller. Now, Betsy, you taught a caller school in the 70s, did you? Yes. Your first caller school was... Yeah. In 19, it was just before I was married, the summer before I was married in 73. The Northern New Jersey Association uh, realized we needed callers. We didn't have enough. The activity was, was big and they needed callers. So they sponsored the callers school. There was no, no callers association. And my dad and I paired together and taught on, I think it was on Staten Island. 
and for some guys from New York State, and then there was somebody else who taught in northern New Jersey, and when, so there were two parts to the school. And it worked out that my dad was kind of the, uh, you know, the good cop, bad cop. My dad was the bad cop. He told them exactly what they had done wrong. And I came along and said, yeah, but also you did this and you did that, and that, that was very good. So you need to work on those, but this, this you can keep going. So, and it worked out. One of the, one of the guys um, went on to form a, a club in Brooklyn, which is still dancing. It's called Ali Moe's. And it, the reason it's called Ali Moe's is the guy, guy's name was Al Moses. His wife's name was Edith. And he spelled it A-L with a capital E, Moe's. And so it com encompassed Al and Edith Moses. I love it. I love it. Now, also, you had produced score dance videos, too. Yes. Later on, um, I have been teaching my, basically the Rutgers Promenaders, I'll go back to, to this, the Rutgers Promenaders in the 60s, actually the club started in 54, and had its 60th anniversary a while ago, and we're still going, although not on campus. Uh, but they used to basically say the club, put an announcement in the club, in the uh, school, newspaper that the club was going to meet on these dates, people would come out and they just walked them through the dances and taught them what they needed to dance that night. And then they announced the next meeting and, and so on. And at the end of the semester, when it came to exam time, the club disbanded until the next semester. At some point in the late 60s, they decided they were trying to, they wanted to go venture out to some of the other clubs that were in northern New Jersey and visit. And they figured they needed to know a little bit more. So they wanted to do lessons. My dad didn't want to work a second night. So he gave me the lessons. And the first set of lessons I did for the club was five weeks. And they, we, we taught most of mainstream, but they were college students, so they got it. Uh, later on, we got, I think, the whole semester. So we, we did mainstream with DVD in, in 12 weeks. And that's how I met Roy. His girlfriend brought him to square dance lessons. <laughs> she broke up with him first. And he dated almost every woman. So fast forward in the club. Fast forward, moving forward from that. So I was teaching a lot, and I inherited a club. A caller moved away, and I inherited his classes. And in this class were a couple named Mal Ralph and Marilyn. And Ralph was a lawyer, and he kept missing classes because he had to travel. He was a high-powered high attorney. So they bought some square dance videos so he could review and learn on his own for the classes he missed. And they looked at these videos that were on the market, and they said, Betsy's a better teacher than what they're doing on this market. We can make a better product. And they approached us, and we formed a company and started doing square dance videos. We first did premise was we first did mainstream. Why? Because the after Ferris wheel, not basic, but from Ferris wheel to, to recycle are the last things that were taught. There are a lot of the things that were done the most and the people got the least practice on them. So if we wanted to keep the dancers in and make them comfortable, if we gave them the stuff they needed the most to review first, then that would help. And so we made this video. We, we approached a company that did the videos for the video production for um, AT&T. This would be about 89, I think, 88 or 89. And they had a studio, and they, we had a director and a makeup person and two cameramen, and the third camera was suspended from the ceiling. So